We're back. Happy Friday, or should I say happy Friday? All right. So, hey, everyone, uh, and welcome back to another episode of MI Live, where we talk about how to make your fitness and nutrition goals realistic, achievable, and sustainable. So I'm Jay White, and with me, as always, is Dr. Brad Dieter. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the show, just make sure you guys ask them, and we will get to every single question throughout the show. Uh, but let's jump right into it. So today, our first topic we're going to talk about are refeeds. So we'll talk about what they are, are they needed, um, are they useful? So Brad, what is a quick summary of what a refeed is? So really what a refeed is, is you take a a day or a specific period where you introduce more calories back in. That's really kind of the most, you know, fundamental way to think about it. Um, and it's really one of those strategies for how you can either increase energy availability, increase carbohydrate availability, um, or, you know, increase just nutrient availability for short periods of time during caloric deficits. Now, Typically, how we see this work is it's kind of a one to three day period in which calories are kind of brought back to maintenance or higher. Um, and usually how this looks or what this looks like in practice is increasing primarily carbohydrates. Now, generally it comes with other calories too, but that's generally what happens. And the, the approach is really used to offset days that are substantially below maintenance calories. Um, and what it can allow you to do is have higher calorie days to you know, improve dietary adherence. So we know that long stretches of calorie deficits can make adherence poor. And it can also help, like if you have a couple days of the week where you have higher training volumes and you wanna make sure your training is adequate and your recovery is adequate, but you still wanna operate at a deficit, this is a strategy you can use for that. Right. So are, are repeats something that everybody has to have? Are they something that some people should avoid? Uh, I would say not everybody needs them. Um, some people probably can avoid them and get better results. So generally what I think about refeeds are very effective for people who are kind of high volume training people, um, athletes, figure competitors, bodybuilders, people that are, you know, kind of in a high training mode, uh, but also need to lose weight. That's a really good tool for that. People who I don't think it's really good for are people who have substantial amounts of weight to lose um, or people who can have problems with adherence after maybe they have higher calorie days. Yeah. That's what I would say. What's, what is your opinion on them and how have you seen them work with your clients? Um, generally, you know, when, when I've, when I've worked with competitors or was competing, they're, a godsend because uh, you have a day where you can actually eat food, especially if you're real low. Um, I think they're really good for for smaller, um, especially smaller females who are you know, around the five foot range, going to be at 1,200 calories anyways. Um, sometimes it's it's worth if they're if they're dieting down on 1,100 or 1,200 calories, it might be sometimes it's worth dropping them an extra 50 calories every day and then giving all those bonus calories on one day so they can have a day where they eat a little bit higher. Um, but I, I've never had the only time I've ever had issues with refeed and I've, I found a lot of people over think that they're, they, that, like you said, they, they can hinder, not hinder results, but slow progress. And I think that there's a, once people have them, um, and get used to dieting and, um, and not eating as and not, and eating more voluminous food, um, I think that they become less useful for the average person. Um, I do think they're a lot more useful for the average person though in the beginning, you know, especially if you're not, if you're brand new dieting, you're trying to lose a lot of weight. It's actually probably a little more helpful because you can still have that one or two days a week of, of being normal, of normal, normal ish levels of food. Um, but for the most part, I'd not, I don't, I don't see a big need for them for most people. When would you say that what's the difference between a refeed and a diet break? Like, you know, yeah. we hear the term diet break all the time. Like how, where would you draw that line? Like where would yeah. you put so, the, the so time wise, I would put a, a, a refeed at one to three days. Um, typically two day max is where I was two days in a row. Um, but a diet break would be at least a week, most likely, uh, up to two, most likely two or more. 
Um, and that's going to be more at your maintenance calories. Whereas at least when I've done it, I've always set my, my, uh, my refeeds are still pretty much below their maintenance might be a little higher, but they're overall daily, your day, your weekly energy intake is going to be still in a deficit with a refeed. Whereas at a diet break, your weekly energy intake is going to be at maintenance. Okay. And can, can diet breaks be beneficial too? Yeah. I think they give you a, uh, that, that mental, the mental break, um, from, you know, being either, if you're obsessed getting obsessed with food, they give you that, that relaxation from it. Um, they allow you to kind of just forget about that. I think that the benefits in, in my opinion, and this is just, um, this is from me seeing it happen with clients. The, the benefit is more psychological than anything with a diet break. Same thing with a refeed for most people. Um, yeah. it, it's that, you know, Hey, I get a break every once a week. I'm doing good. I get a break. If you're controlling the the calorie intake, not going off the hinges on your refeed. Um, it's a lot <clears throat> easier for people to diet longer with a refeed. Um, but I think it's a lot easier for people to maintain life and travel and things with a diet break. If you, if you do it right and you're going to diet for six months for a vacation and you get down there, you're dieting for six months, you get there, you take a, a two or three week diet break. And then you come back and you say, okay, I want to lose another, you know, uh, n- another 5% of my body weight and then maintain for a month and then go back, go back on diet break and then go into a bulk. And I think that those, those are where they are. I don't think they're the end all be all solutions for everybody, but they are definitely uh, great tools to utilize in certain situations with certain people. Word. I agree with that. I 100% agree. Um, and, any, and if you have any questions on diet breaks uh, or refeeds, this, this would be a good time to ask those questions. And whoever was in here yesterday who had a bunch of general questions, now's the time to just start throwing them at us because we will get to them. You're a refeed. I wish I was a refeed. So Brad, if you were confused on refeeds, where would who what 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 would a coach would would our coaches be able to work with somebody? Would let me rephrase that. Would a reputable coach be able to work with somebody on a refeed and setting up refeeds? Yes. Okay. Would a macros ink coach be able to do that? They are highly qualified to do that. In fact, so, we have even had continuing education about that. We have. We, we have, have had numerous discussions about how to implement those with our clients. So, where could somebody go to sign up for coaching to work with a macros ink coach to find out? <clears throat> they would go to there's no w macros inc. Oh my god. Oh that my god. Would be, that's the home landing page, aka the splash page. <laughs> um, then if they even click on services, they can sign up for complete coaching where you get nutrition and training coaching. Or you can sign for sign up for just nutrition coaching, um, which is under the nutrition coaching tab. And if you need a little bit of convincing to sign up, um, you can use a two week free trial for the nutrition coaching option. Yeah, at macrosinc.net. Brad, do you, see my, do you see my my OG macros inc shirt? The original oh, man, there's been so many changes in the last year. Yeah, that's almost was that last year? Or was that the year before? That was, was last, last year. year. Yeah. A lot of that was one of the first big things we did when I came on board. Yeah, it absolutely was. All right, so let's jump into our second topic. Are you ready? Numero dos. Hit me with your best shot. All right, so next thing we are talking about is, I don't even remember what the heck's our second topic. timeline for a successful bulk. And what what were we going to call this one? Uh, I was going to call this the the road to swoldom. Wasn't that what I was going to call it? Yeah. If anybody knows what book that's from, what book I, I don't know if that's where you got it from, but that's what reminded me. I just just made it up. Oh, after how many weeks of deficit, is it a good time for a diet break real quick, Brad? Um, It, it really depends. Um, The best thing to do is just make sure it's structured and planned. Like, don't just be like, "Ah, I need a diet break. Like be like, okay, I'm going to go six weeks. Then I'm going to take a week or I'm going to go two weeks on two weeks off, or I'm going to go 10 weeks, two weeks or 12 weeks, one week. Like just, Really set that. Now, if you didn't really think about it ahead of time, um, you know, I tell people if you've kind of been stuck, you know, and maybe adherence is dropping and you're feeling pretty burnt out, 
and you've been feeling like that for like two to three weeks, I would maybe consider, you know, taking like a week to 10 days of a diet break. Um, anytime you really kind of hit a plateau for more than a couple weeks and it's pretty mental, then it's time to switch stuff up. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Keep going until you can't do it anymore. So back to bulking. How do we get swole? Swole. So How do you get swole or what is a good timeline for it? Yeah. <laughs> that, that was not a yes or no question. Yes, it was. No, it wasn't. How much time does it take me to get swole? And uh, how much time do I need to get swole? Yeah. So there's a lot of pieces to this question. Um, the first, I would say, kind of plot a like logarithmic curve. I, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a big word. I, I lift weights. I don't know it's that. It's a curve that goes like this. So it's a, a bell curve. No. It's a round curve. An oval. It's, a half, it's a half of a U turned on its side. Does it end? Does it go back to the to zero? Uh, no, it's a half of a U turned on its side, and then it stops wherever you pick up your pencil. Oh. So I understand. first draw that graph, and then the further off, the further to the right you are in your training history or how much muscle you've already gained, that's the rate of change at which you can expect, right? So the more training history you have, or the closer you are to kind of your genetic potential, the slower progress is going to be. The newer you are and the further away from your genetic potential, the faster progress is going to be. So that's the first piece. And then the second piece would be determining how okay or comfortable are you with some excess body fat coming with muscle growth, right? So if you want to be more on the, I want to be as hyper conservative and as lean as possible while I'm doing this, also put yourself closer to that end of the the curve. I should make an infographic on this. And the more comfortable you are with, uh, you know, putting on a little bit of extra body fat while you're bulking, put yourself on the, the part of the curve where you can have more progress. And then once you have those two things figured out, then it really is, if you're a man gaining, you know, anywhere from, about a half a pound to a pound a month of muscle tissue mm -hmm. is a fairly reasonable target. That's if you're natural and not taking any drugs. How about a female? A female, I think it's probably closer to like a quarter of a pound mm -hmm. to about three quarters of a pound a month. It's probably oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So that when people tell me like, hey, I gained six pounds of muscle in a month, it's like, mm, I don't know if that's true. What if they were on a lot of drugs? Then yes, that's 100% possible. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, if you gain six pounds in a month, it's possible. You just didn't gain six pounds of muscle Muscle, if you're natural. You can gain way more than six pounds in a month. Right. No, yeah, it's possible. You just, just didn't muscle gain tissue. muscle. Right. Yeah. What, what, about, what about when my in-body scan tells me that I gained six pounds of lean mass in three weeks? It's probably water change. Okay. That's okay. generally what that would be. So... Now, I, th I think when we, we the, the biggest cons the biggest issue I see, especially in our in the Facebook group, is people not knowing whether they should start bulking or dieting first. Um, my 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 general blanket statement is you should probably diet first, um, and I follow that up with if you have to, if you don't know if you should be bulking, you probably should diet. That's probably pretty reasonable. Yeah, I mean, if, if if you can see abs, then we probably and, and I mean, if you can see all six abs, then there's you probably should should bulk, right? What if I'm so lean I can see my organs? Yeah, then you then you like, need a doctor because you're okay. not doing well. I mean, if you have striations anywhere, you should definitely not go into probably diet. You should start bulking, um, but you know, let we have a most people are trying to lose weight, not gain weight in the initial part of their, their fitness. Um, so I would definitely say you should be going up to, to diet first and then, um, you should go to diet and then try a bulk. So if I'm dieting for, let's say I, I diet down for, I diet down for three months. I hit my goal weight. I hit my goal. I'm happy with what I see. I'm lean enough. And I say, okay, I'm ready to, to start bulking. How long should I go for my first phase of my bulk? Um, and for I, 
wants, I'm sorry, Brad, for anybody who wants more info, we actually have an article on that and that's right here. Yes. So I'm a, first of all, I will say that I am the biggest hypocrite and I violate this rule all the time because I'm just a weirdo. Um, but I always tell people the first time you bulk, you need to give yourself at least six months because mm -hmm. um, it will take a long time for you to get really noticeable results. Um, and the longer, the first bulk you do, the longer it is, the better your long-term progress is gonna be. Mm -hmm. I don't have any data from a scientific journal to support that, but that's generally what I've seen over my career, is yeah. the longer your bulks are, the better. The better. Because um, the more you spend in periods of bulking and cutting, and like the mm -hmm. more cycles you go through, the less effective each one is, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like you need to get you need to be in the bulking period for quite a while. Right. You can, you should probably bulk way more often than you cut. Yeah. No. I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You I, should I, spend I, more I, of your career in a bulk yeah. than you should in a cut. Yeah. No, I definitely agree with that. Uh, Pete Fitchin, who's a PhD. Mr. Yeah. Who uh, Pete, uh, for anybody who does not know, Pete is, is a PhD in nutrition from University of Illinois, and he's a, a pro bodybuilder, pro natural bodybuilder. And uh, he has a, a really cool infographic that he shares all the time. He's tracked, I, I think, for 10 or 15 years, he's tracked his, his surpluses and deficits. And Pete's a, a really, like, really solid physique um, on him. And he has uh, spent, I want to say it's over 90% of his 10 to 15-year lifting career in a surplus. And you know what's funny? I bet if Pete, like added up the surplus and the deficits like amounts over the course of his career mm -hmm. and like track the net difference. That would probably be, if you broke it down calorie wise, that would probably be about how much lean mass he's added. I bet it's within 15%. I think he did that. And it was like within like 10%. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm I would not say it's, the math works out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was the one who got me onto that. Like, stop dieting and start bulking if you want to, if you want to build muscle and like bulking for long periods of time. Um, and, and I, I always, the, one of the rules that I've always gone with is in a, in a three to one or a four to one ratio. So for every three to four months you bulk, you should diet, be prepared afterwards to diet for one month. So that just shows you how long you should bulk be bulking compared to dieting. And you know, like you said, slower is better with, with, with bulking. We'd like to, it's, I would rather be at maintenance trying to build muscle, um, than dieting, trying to build muscle. And I'd rather be at maintenance trying to build muscle than bulking way too fast and build muscle. You know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, if you, you, you'll build probably, you'll most likely build more muscle if you're bulking a little too much than being at maintenance, but you're going to have to diet all that down and, you know, none of us, if you, if you diet, if you're dieting down after you just got lean and then built back up, you're probably going to diet pretty aggressive. Um, and the faster you diet, the, the more muscle mass you lose. So okay. yeah. if somebody wanted to really nerd out on what's the ideal, uh, energy surplus for optimizing lean mass to fat mass, mm -hmm. there may be a paper that was written on this. <laughs> And it may be somewhat related to macro zinc. Okay. Let me, uh, uh, we should share that with people. And if people are interested, we can get you a full text copy of the PDF. Here's or the, you can just go to it. Here's the giant link and I'm putting it in the comments. Now, if you're in our Facebook group, you cannot see the comment unless somebody else wants to post it. Cause I can't post there. But if you're on our YouTube channel or on our page, you can absolutely see that. Uh, I can post to it. I bet. If you're logged in, yep. I am. I just have, I'm going to post this right there. Bang. <laughs> All set, amigo. Uh, Hannah said she does love eating. <laughs> I enjoy a good eating too. Yeah. Uh, Julie said, if I go into maintenance after being in a deficit, should you move into this by slowly adding calories and more macros or just moving right into maintenance? <sighs> Um, Go ahead. My thought process is what is the process you're trying to do by trying to go from deficit to maintenance mm -hmm. and how fast can I make that process happen? Really the goal from going to a deficit and to maintenance is to stop losing weight, 
and kind of maybe help address any of the metabolic adaptations that have occurred, give you more energy to train, make you feel and sleep better. That process occurs much quicker if you jump right into maintenance. Um, and it's not like you're going to be going from losing weight to gaining weight. You're just going to be going from losing weight to stopping losing weight. And the faster you can do that, the better, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and I think that, and, and there are accurate, more accurate ways to do it than others. If we're losing, you know, that 3,500 calorie per pound rule is a, a great guide that people, I don't know why people shit all over it all the time, but you know, if you're losing a pound a week, I'm going to add back in. I might even go a little lower. I might add 400 calories a day. See how I do my weight. You, you know, yeah. And you have to give it probably a, a solid week of that. Cause when I add in 400 calories, my, my weight's going to go up on the scale because you're gaining water weight. You have more sodium holding more water again, and then you have food in your system. Um, so I think it's important to jump up, hold there for a week. And once you, you know, you'll gain three to four pounds and then you'll just hold there and level off. And if you're not dropping anymore, just stay there and that's it. And if you're, if you're still, if you drop even more, add another hundred in. I can agree with that. When, when you increase Brad by, let's say I'm, let's say we're going to increase or decrease. Let's say we're going to decrease my calories by, by a hundred or increase them. Cause I'm trying to build tomatoes by hundred. What, what's the breakdown of macros you do for that? For, in, for going from deficit to maintenance. Correct. Or, uh, generally it's, increasing carbohydrates and fats because your protein doesn't change a whole lot. Yeah. Um, so it's generally just increasing those mostly. And it's probably like a, uh, I mean, each client's a little bit different. Um, but I would say it's generally a, if you're doing a hundred calorie adjustment back up, you're probably looking at 15 grams of carbohydrates and five, and fat. five fats yep. somewhere in the neighborhood. Yep. I do that. Or depending on which they have a preference for, I'll go 25 carbs and two fat, but yeah. Yeah. Same. Yep. Uh, Hannah said, Oh, he really had a cool pass compared. Yeah. So Hannah's talking about Pete Fitchin's uh, post. So she obviously thought too, he had a really cool post comparing his progress over 20 years. Yeah, he has. And he has like his pictures um, are like in the exact same spot for like, for like 12 of his years, he has the pictures, pictures in the same spot. So it's kind of neat. This kind of concerns me. Uh, I think it was his parents' house. Okay. I was like, maybe he, ha he hasn't like painted or hung any different pictures or anything. No, no, no. It was, it was like his parents' house right by the bathroom or something. And a lot of them when he was younger. Hooray for food. I do like food. Brad, you just texted me something and it didn't load. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's, that's nice. It is very cool. I just... I I had – it just got emailed to me and it popped up and I had to share it with you because it's very cool. <laughs> but, Brad, with all of this being said about bulking, if yes. I need food to bulk, where exactly would you recommend somebody goes to get food for bulk? Because I need a lot of food. Um, if you would like food delivered to your door that is macro-friendly um, and is made by a small business owner who is a – client of Macros Inc. Um, and you would like to help support that while feeding yourself and minimizing your dishes and making your life substantially easier with delicious food, go to motherofmacros.com, use the code MACROS10 to get 10% off your order. I am so pumped for mine coming next week. I'm not even going grocery shopping this weekend. Ooh, man, look at you being a rebel. I am rebellious. I'm, I'm I'm very shocked. I'm very rebellious. All right. So now, now that we've talked about refeeds for dieting, how to success, how to bulk. Let's talk about the one that everybody hates. Is cardio required for fat loss? Can you run your way to abs? Um, yeah. yeah. So let's, let's talk about that one first. Can I just lose weight with exercise and no diet? You can. But it is relatively inefficient. Uh, uh, if you think about what are what is the most efficient way to lose weight, it's generally through reducing food intake. Um, can you lose weight by exercising a substantial amount? Yes, but it's kind of the worst lever to pull for weight loss. Now, maintenance is a very different story, right? One of the hard parts, I think, like people will see 
professional athletes or, you know, very uh, high volume exercising people who are very thin and in great shape. And they'll be like, oh, see, they just exercise and they, you know, can keep a good body weight. There's a huge difference between maintenance and weight loss, right? Like you can exercise for a couple hours a day um, and you can eat a substantial amount of food and you can maintain weight. Mm -hmm. But trying to lose weight, trying to lose a meaningful amount of weight just through exercise alone is very difficult. Right. If you're like an ultra marathon runner, maybe. Yeah. It's kind of like the way that I think about it is um, like, let's say you, I always like to use financials because it's very easy, right? Like, let's say you are spending every penny that comes in, right? And it's very easy to kind of maintain your bank account right? Without any major effort. Now, if you're trying to save a lot of money, trying to do that while expending a lot of money and earning a lot of money is a lot different, right? right. It's like trying to do the math to add the stuff up over time doesn't work. Yeah. And, and I think that it's, you know, there, there's such a, a, a misconception that people are not necessarily like it's not people throwing well kind of is maybe people are throwing out there on purpose but there's just this such this misconception that all you need to do is exercise and you'll lose weight and that, and that's it and you know the problems that i see with that you know you you go into a gym and what's the number one thing that that commercial gyms have they have cardio equipment what's the number you know what's the biggest thing that any gym advertises personal training. They're not, most gyms don't even touch nutrition. They don't talk about it. And when they do, it's by supplements. Um, and the, the things that work nutrition, you're talking about people always looking for quick fixes because it's not something that you can do one hour or two hours or three hours a week. It's something you have to do multiple days. Um, and it's just one of those things that I, I think people, I think that's probably the hardest battle that, that anybody who has lost weight or wants to lose weight ha, has fought or will fight is the getting out of that. It's only you can out train a bad diet mentality. Um, don't we have a lecture that we gave that's accessible on YouTube on this exact topic? I don't remember. But don't let's, let's, get in, let's get in the second part. Do I have to perform cardio? Well, let's get in. Can I, can I lose weight without performing cardio? 100%. Do I, will, is cardio, so cardio is not required for fat loss. Is that the definitive answer? Correct. You do not need to use cardio for weight loss. Will it make it easier, better, or faster? It will make it faster, better, but maybe not easier because cardio is probably not that easy. Okay. And how, so how it makes it faster is you can use it to increase your calorie deficit, mm -hmm. right? So let's say I do an extra 200 calories of cardiovascular training a day. That's just accelerating my weight loss, right? So I have a bigger calorie deficit. It's better in that the fact you will have better cardiovascular adaptations and better cardiovascular health at the end of your weight loss. Easier in the fact that now you have to put on your running shoes or cycling yeah. shoes or uh, your, your, brand, your Brad Morgan spandex. Dude, I have a pair. Probably going to go on a bike ride this afternoon. Oh, yeah. You can't ride a bike without it. I, you're a, get, a road you're, bike hurts your butt so bad. You're getting muted. You're going to get shut off. Uh, spandex shorts. That's right. I just ate a veggie straw live. Yeah. Yep. They're not made. They're, they're not like good. These aren't? No. Oh, they're delicious. No. They're a very good 100-calorie salty snack. That takes me like two hours to eat. That's because they're so bad. You have to like just suffer after every single bite. No, but I've always wondered if I could drink water through the straw part of them. Uh, I have tried. You cannot. Do they just like disintegrate? Um, I believe that they're too, they're too airy, I think, was the problem. You couldn't get any suction through it. <laughs> I'm so glad that we know this. Yeah, this, these are these are the things that I do when I'm trying new foods. You have to stick. You know. um, so that being said, what are some of the benefits you do get from cardio? Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, like you said, if you're if you're dieting and, and, and performing cardio, you are going to get to eat a little bit more uh, food, or you can keep your food lower and lose it a little bit faster rate. 
Um, but that's insignificant. The big benefits are going to be the cardiovascular and health benefits of it. That's the, the number one, the number one benefit to it. Um, so what are some of the cardiovascular benefits from doing uh, cardio? Well, so the, a lot of the cardiovascular benefits are going to be wrapped and, um, my God, the only word I can think of is synergenic, synergenic, and that's not the word I want. Synergistic? They're going to complement, uh, they're going to be complemented by weight loss. So a lot of them are just going to have a crossover benefit. Um, your, your, your blood pressure can lower, you'll lower your heart rate. Uh, you can lower your respiratory rate, increase your, um, VO2 max. Um, <clears throat> the, I'm sure you'll point out 8,000 studies because my mind goes blank when people ask me things, but, um, you will, you'll definitely, the, the benefits for it are definitely going to outweigh the outweigh not anything you can come up with for not doing any form of cardio. Um, except unless you just don't like it. Like I hate cardio. I think it's the worst thing in the world. Yeah. I mean, the thing is it's, if you want to really optimize your long-term health, doing cardiovascular exercise is kind of a non-negotiable. Now you don't have to do cardio to maintain a healthy body weight and to get most of the benefits of exercise, like resistance training, maintaining a healthy body weight, reducing sarcopenia, all that stuff. But if you want to have the optimal long-term health outcome, you do need to do some cardiovascular training. Yeah. I heard you wrong. And I thought you said, I thought you said causing sarcopenia. I was like, weightlifting is causing sarcopenia now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, what? what the Star starvation mode. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, and for, for cardio, if we're, if we're doing cardio to aid in weight loss, is there any, specific type of cardio that's going to be better that's going to that's going to cause faster weight loss than another uh no not really okay. i mean there's some that are more like calorically expensive per unit of time yeah. right which is like if i work out for an hour one's going to drive a bigger calorie deficit um you know that's that's like things like uh it, it really is the more work you do right so if you're yeah. If you're running for an hour, you're probably expending more energy than if you're cycling for an hour versus if you're walking for an hour. If you're swimming for an hour, you're expending in a, a boatload. Um, so really, if you're rowing for an hour, that's even more. So, so, so Chris just asked, what are your thoughts on uh, list versus hit? So low intensity steady state cardio versus high in, uh, intensity interval training for fat loss. Seems when HIT came into the scene, it was suggested a more effective way at burning fat than lists. And Brad, you can go into the details. I believe that th there's like a 1% benefit, a very small, minute benefit on one of them. I can't remember which, but the benefit of HIT is up front in the in the immediate time you're doing it. You burn more, you consume more energy, but low intensity is a longer throughout the 24 hour period, correct? Or the, the, yeah. same, the same at 24 hours. Yeah, it's just really the. There, there's two pieces to it. One is they have very different effects on the body. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for doing them is very different, right? Um, some of the benefits of HIT are you can get the same amount of caloric expenditure in a shortened time window. Um, you do get kind of a, a X or a, a post exercise, post exercise oxygen consumption. So you do get a little bit of an elevated fat loss, after you're done training. Now, yeah. that's not like a big net difference over the course of a day. Yeah. Um, there are maybe some minor improvements in like insulin sensitivity over over low intensity mm -hmm. steady state. Um, but some of the cons are most people don't actually do hit to where the level you need to do it. Um, mm -hmm. like high intensity is very high intensity. It's super uh, sprinting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the orthopedic and musculoskeletal. Uh, problems generally make it inaccessible to people who are not highly trained, right? Like mm -hmm. imagine trying to sprint on a treadmill or cycle really hard and fast on a bike or row really hard on a system that is not used to that type of mm -hmm. uh, load, right? You get a lot of musculoskeletal issues. Um, and then it's just generally adherence to it over time is pretty bad. Like people just don't like doing it for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So what about, what about a combination of hit and less? 
Yeah, I think people should do both, right? Like I think you should do maybe a one to two sessions of hit a week. Um, and that can even be as short as 10 minutes. And then, yeah. you know, a couple sets of, of a couple sets, a couple sessions of lists a week too. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you for that question. We have some other questions. Up yeah, too, I, I just saw that one we were talking about, so I put it up. Um, another hooray for food. Foodie uh, food food. What advice do you normally give women who, women who suddenly stop getting their periods while in a deficit? Would be cool if the women coaches can chime in too. Stop dieting is number one. Yes. Um, we're going to um, go ahead. I mean, I think one of the things to realize is that's a very normal process, right? Like when you don't mm -hmm. have energy availability, it's an evolutionary mechanism. Um, right. So it really depends on like what the context is, right? There's context where, you know, amenorrhea or losing your period is very bad. And there's mm -hmm. context where it's normal and we should expect it, right? Like if you have a short-term weight loss, that's, you know, six months and you really just need to lose a lot of weight and then you're going to return to normal feeding and you're under the directions of a doctor and they're following it. Yeah. Pretty normal. Right. Um, but if you're like an athlete who's super active and you're in a deficit and you don't really need to be losing weight in your, that happens, then we probably need to stop the dieting and fix that pretty quickly. So yeah. it's really contextual and there's no like blanket advice. That's perfect. But if you're ever unsure, what's the first thing they should do? Stop dieting. Stop dieting and talk to a physician. OBGYN. Yeah. Uh, Sherry, I'm in a, I'm at a moderate deficit, but I'm only losing two to three pounds per month for the last three months. If I want to lose a little faster, should I cut a hundred calories? I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking of Kurt. I'm thinking of cutting about nine grams of fat. Um, I would say at two to three pounds a month, unless you have a huge amount of weight to lose, that's pretty darn good progress, right? That's about three quarters of a pound a week, which is right on track. So that means two to three pounds a month over the course of a year, that's 30 pounds, 30 pounds in a year is a lot. That's a lot. And that's, that's like on the higher end of what we see in like big weight loss studies in the nutrition literature, right? So if you look in these big intervention studies that have a really tight control, I mean, 15 kilos. So about 30 pounds is kind of the, like the peak people who lose the most weight. Like I could even pull up a graph and show you that's pretty much spot on. Yeah, I mean that's like a uh, thirty pounds is what like a four year old. Yeah, that's that's like a three or four year old. So it's like a little doggo. That's a lot of weight. Doggo. So what really happens in terms of muscle gain if you're not really lean and decide to bulk? You'll build muscle. You'll build muscle. Your yeah. ratio of building muscle to building fat will be lower. So we do know that, right? If you mm -hmm. if you are very lean, your ratio of lean mass to fat mass during a bulk is a little bit higher than if you're not lean. Your yeah. calorie partitioning is much more efficient if you're lean. If you're lean, yeah. How do you get water? How do you get your water in? Do you think using individual flavor mixes like crystallite is a detriment and would you count these towards your water intakes? Yeah, I used to use crystallite, drink two gallons a day, throw a packet in a gallon of water, mix it up and drink it. There's no, any fluid intake that's not alcohol counts for your daily water intake. Beer counts for your water intake. Oh, there's a lot of alcohol in it. Huh? Beer counts. Yeah. For your water intake? Yeah. Is it just because it's not enough concentrated alcohol? Yeah, there was a paper published on it. That's kind of interesting. All there's, right. There's been a paper that was published on beer counts towards hydration status. I think oh. that may be the title. I'm going to look it up. I'm in. Do you, did you ever watch the Drew Carey show? Uh, yes. So there used to be a, he did, a, there was an episode where he, he invested in a thing called, um, uh, Vita beer and it was vitamin beer. And he was, every time he'd take a drink, he's like, look, I'm getting my workout in. Vita beer. Vita beer. Yeah. Let's see. Um, does does cardio have to make you feel like you're puking for for effectiveness? Absolutely not. Only if it's J. Brad, if I if I run a mile or if I walk a mile, which burns more calories? I think they burn the same, oh. give or take. Well, all right. Yes. Is it true that you can increase your VO2 before cardio? If so, that you can increase your VO2 max before cardio? If so, when should you eat them? 
I think they said oh, that you need beets. beets. I, I missed the word beets. That was the one I missed. I was like, what the heck? Is it true that um, beets can increase your VO2 before cardio? This is this does appear to be true in some contexts. Um, in others, it doesn't appear to be effective. Now, it has to do primarily with vasodilation um, and allowing more blood flow so you get more oxygen and more nutrient delivery and just you can – have a higher VO2. The other very interesting thing about VO2 mm -hmm. is the calculation is based on your body weight. Mm -hmm. So like if you take a diuretic or you go on like a pretty low carb diet for a couple of days, mm -hmm. you can actually see changes in your VO2 just based on your body weight. Even if you're, even if your physical performance is the same, the fact that you have a lower body weight, your VO2 will be higher. Huh? Interesting. Will I burn more calories running a faster mile, or is it really just burning the same amount of calories in a smaller amount of time? Uh, as we just talked about two seconds ago before I saw this and I asked the same question, same calories, smaller amount of time. Um, but if you run at five miles an hour for an hour versus five miles an hour or versus 10 miles an hour for an hour, you're going to burn more calories running at 10 miles an hour. Right, yeah. If you're going faster, that would make sense. Yeah, because you're going further at the same time. Going further, that's what I meant. Yeah, if Which you're going, you're doing more work. Right. Yes, that makes sense. What is neat? This magnifying, glass, this magnifying glass is neat. That is your jeweler loop. It is. That's my my loop. Um, neat is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So all the movement that you do throughout the day, uh, that's not exercise. So fidgeting, walking around, um. Brad, would you classify walking the dog as neat or as yeah. exercise? I would too. I'd, I'd count it as neat. Yeah. I Unless you're running your dogs. Yeah. Well, I've seen people who, you know, if you're extremely sedentary and like you let your dogs on the backyard and then you say, I'm going to start losing weight and then classify that as part of your activity. I've seen people do that. No, that's fine. Yeah. You know, I, I agree. I mean, but yeah, but typically neat is anything that's not planned exercise or activity. Yeah. For the sake of activity, right? Yeah. Like walking your dog is more of like completing a task than exercising. Um, right. Going on a hike for going on a hike sake is exercise. Yeah, that's not that it matters, but what do you think about front loading your day? So eating the most for breakfast and then gradually decreasing meal size by the time you get to dinner. I'm okay with that. Yeah, the the only issue that because I've 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 tried it myself, and the only issue that I see and why I went back to less food in the morning and more in the evening is because willpower declines throughout the day, um, so it's a lot harder to have less food at the end of the day and then fight hunger cravings. So if it works for you, it works. That's absolutely fine. But that is one caution that I would carry. Yeah, I mean, so I'm kind of the opposite, like. I would rather have a big breakfast and a smaller dinner. Like generally I'm not like a eat a lot of food late at night person. You're just that person. I am maybe an alien. We don't know yet. Ellie has follow question. Uh, follow question. Uh, just having vegetables and protein for dinner and having your carbs for the, for the early meal. If that works for you, that's fine. Yeah. The spread don't have all your protein in there, spread your protein throughout the day. But yeah, if you want to have your carbs at night, carbs in the morning, vegetables in the evening, it's perfect. Whatever works for you. Somebody just messaged into the macro zinc message line yeah. with the greatest marketing snippet I've ever heard that we have not used. Oh, okay. They asked for a macro makeover. I'll give you a macro makeover. Isn't that genius? We should yeah. start using that. Do you want a macro makeover? Yeah, I do. Use our I, macro. I, I, oh, that's our next Facebook and Google ad. Oh my God. I want uh blush for it though. You don't blush. You don't get blush. Yeah, I want blush and eyeshadow. And so Brad. You'd look good with some uh, eyeliner. Yeah, I know. No, actually, I refuse to let anything go near my eye. <sighs> Why not? Uh, I don't like eye doctors. I don't like contacts. I don't like glasses. I don't like like any of that. Nope. My wife. Do you, own a, do you own a telescope? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a mead. I want to get one. Yeah. I, I need a new one. I want to, I, I used to have a really nice computerized one and now then I had, now I have a, uh, an older one that has the weights on it. Um, so if anybody here enjoyed what they heard and wants to learn more and is like, where can I get more information? 
you can go to macrosync.net. We have a two week free trial for coaching. Um, it's, it's literally a free trial. You go in, you work with a coach for two weeks. If you like it, you, you, you keep going. If you don't, you let us know. We cancel it and you're, and you're done. Macrosync.net. It's a two week free trial for our nutrition coaching. It's that little link right there. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And we'll get you all set up. You get a client group access to a client group. You get to, uh, Brad sends you, uh, pictures of his feet all the time. It's, I just don't know why, but he does. Um, and that's pretty much it. Also, how good have our emails been lately? Um, yeah, I've been typing them. That's why. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was funny. That came up in a meeting today. Oh, we'll talk about that later. It was, it was pretty awesome. I got a good chuckle out of it. You're a chuckle. So let's recap what we talked about. Let's recap, kids, what we talked about today. So today we talked about refeed days. Brad, are they needed? They are not needed, but they can be very helpful tools. Okay. Uh, how long should a refeed day last? A refeed day should last a day. Maybe two. Okay. If in extreme circumstances, three. Okay. Uh, what is the timeline for a successful bulk? How long, what's the minimum you would say so much bulk when they're ready to? The minimum, I'm on, I'm always on the conservative side. I would say a minimum of 16 weeks. Okay. So there's that four months. Yes. Yep. Okay. And then, and, and is slower better or faster better for a bulk? Uh, I would say neither. Okay. How much weight would a typical typical male want to gain per month? I would say somewhere between a half a pound and a pound a month is a good solid number to go after. Okay. So like 1% of your body weight? Yeah. Per month and a female? Um, about the same percentage. 1%. Generally about a quarter to three quarters of a pound per month. Okay. In some cases, men can get up to you know, maybe two pounds a month mm -hmm. um, and what can get up to a pound and a half ish just mm -hmm. kind of depends on each context, but those are kind of good rules of thumb and percentage wise ballpark. If somebody's enhanced uh, for anybody doesn't know that means steroids for somebody who's enhanced, uh, how, how much weight should they try to gain during a bulk as much as their drugs will allow. Okay. I mean, it's like, if you're going to do it, do it. Yeah. That's a fair, a fair statement. But don't do it unless you have a prescription by a doctor and you are following all the legal requirements around utilizing said substances and you are fully aware of the long-term health repercussions. And yeah, if you have a partner, greatness. you've discussed it with your partner. Greatness. That's the long-term health effect. Mm, Being kick ass. That's brain, brain atrophy is not great. I mean... That's I, one of the most... That's one of the documented side effects now, long-term results like long-term follow-up studies yeah or is that just from a bunch of gym bros punching each other in the head saying good job bro good job bro it could be that too <laughs> you know, like just getting smacked over and over and over again it could very much be that and our last time we talked about was weight loss uh was cardio required for weight loss cardio is not required for weight is loss. it recommended yes will it aid in weight loss yes will it be a big aid uh, it will be a minor to moderate aid, Perfect. but I'm one of those people. If you're doing it, do it right. Yeah. Like an extra, maybe 90 minutes a week of some cardiovascular training. It's good for your heart. Good for your weight loss. Um, good for your suntan. If you're going outside right now, good for your vitamin D production, good for your mental health. Here's, here's a question, Brad, as we are in the middle of getting a, another horse, how, how would you rate horseback riding on the rate on a cardio scale? I have ridden one horse at one point in my life. And that is a, that is a story all in of its own. I really um, want you ride a horse now. I have to be in a full biohazmat suit to ride a horse. <laughs> I'm actually not kidding. Um, oh, I'm so horses. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I did a research study last this fall slash winter on horses and I spent all day in the barn and I was so stuffy. I like almost couldn't drive home. I couldn't see. It was so bad. I think but I would, I would imagine it's probably a good workout. Yeah. I mean, like I'm thinking like a jockey, obviously I, I actually took a class on jockey nutrition. I don't know how I got into it, but I did. Um, jockeys have really messed up nutrition, like really Dude, bad. That's because they just don't eat. <laughs> yeah. And they eat a lot of biscuits. I don't know why. 
they think biscuits have no calories. Um, like rice cakes? No, like biscuits because it's an English thing. I miss rice cakes. Those yeah. are delicious. I have them in my house. I like rice cakes. I do too. Um, the, yeah, I, I think that like if you were a jockey or if you were like doing shows like like fast shows like like western riding like a barrel race or something a lot but i don't i don't know about trail riding i mean you have to you have to stand up straight i mean it obviously does some you know but but really the horse is doing the work i'm gonna look that up i'll wear a heart rate monitor next time i go right like this do, 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 two do, hands brad two hands no. and that's and that's why you don't like horses i mean that's you could I, you, you could do one but you have to have a pistol in the other that's fine. Did you know that's a thing where you like do pistol shooting at balloons? Yeah. That's pretty awesome. If you um, ask. We watch horse stuff on YouTube. Like we watch the horses on the YouTubies. Um, so. Well, any other last minute points of discussion before we have our very fancy outro music? <laughs> I think that's it. I think we're done. We're done for the week, everybody. Goodbye. Oh, yeah. Today's Friday. Um, that means same macro time, same macro place. Monday, we will be into... Oh, Monday, we are going to have Corey Rob with us. <gasps> I do like myself a Corey Rob. We're going to have Corey. Corey's going to be here. What did, uh, what did we brag Corey with? Because generally, he like, doesn't yeah, have time. Yeah, I, I said, what do you have available next week? And he's like, Monday. Actually, he said every day. I said, how's Monday? He's like, I, and then I gave him, I said, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. He's like, Monday. Okay, good. I was like, Corey's generally too busy to talk to me. Yeah, so. no, he, he, he said, no, Monday, I'll be there. I said, okay. So if you have questions, think about them. We can ask him to Corey on Monday. We're going to be discussing uh, what to look for in a coach, what makes you run away from a coach, and what makes you a good client. Yeah, Corey, uh, Corey will be awesome to have on. He's the coach whisperer. Dude, he is a wizard of wizards. He is. All I right. Gotta talk, I got to talk to him today. It was pretty fun. I'm sorry. Oh, don't we have a meeting with Corey in like 20 minutes? Uh, 21 minutes and like 35 seconds. Okay. Well, then I will see you and Corey then. Bingo. Bada bing, bada boom. Have a good weekend, guys.